Good evening. I'm Brian Giebler, and thank you so much for joining me this evening to celebrate the release of my debut album on Bridge Records, A Lad's Love. From hill and valley, the devil, the While I'm sad not to be celebrating this with you in person, I am grateful that perhaps this video will reach a larger audience and share more insight into the making of this album than I could perhaps have done in person. Tonight, we will hear from all the wonderful musicians that joined me on this disc, including my dear friend and pianist, Stephen McGee. We will also hear from English composer Ian Venables, the only living composer represented on the disc. The album includes 20th century English art songs by Ivor Gurney, Benjamin Britten, John Ireland, Roger Quilter, Peter Warlock, and Ian Venables, all centered around the theme of loss, whether due to death, societal standards, unrequited love, the passage of time, or inaction. Of course, this album would not have been possible without the generous support of many wonderful donors. To thank them, I would like to start off tonight by presenting a montage of video clips from the recording sessions in June of last year. Please enjoy.
in the heat. The dog, the lady with parcels, and the boy. There is the casual life outside the And now it's my pleasure to introduce my dear friend, colleague, and pianist, Stephen McGee. We met back in 2010 at the University of Michigan, where he was completing his doctoral degree and I was doing my master's degree. Stephen, it's such a pleasure to have you joining us this evening. Thanks, Bri. Good to see you. Good to see you. So do you want to tell anyone about a little bit of what your background is and how you came to meet me and how you ended up in Michigan? Uh, sure. I did my master's degree at Michigan um, several years before that and was living in New York City, actually, and decided to come back to Michigan to do my doctorate um, and met you there. Um, but the funny thing is that actually, without knowing this, we are actually from very close to the same hometown in Pennsylvania. Um, we both had connections to the same church in Phoenixville. Um, there's a bit of an age difference as re evidenced by my, the white in my beard. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, uh, it, was, it was a serendipitous thing and it wound up being a kind of a cool part of our shared history. And actually one of the great things about that church was it was the church that I grew up in with my family. And uh, when we were looking at places to do this program as a recital, it was one of the places we went back to and actually did the recital, one of the five places. And it's the place that actually you and I both did our senior high school recitals, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Me, me on voice and trumpet and you. On flute and piano, yeah. That's amazing. And, and I sang a little bit too. I had a whole bunch of instruments back in my day that were my favorite things. So with some friends and I did a recital, yeah. And then in 2012, I had the opportunity to do my master's degree recital, which you played on. Mm -hmm. um, and the main piece that I chose for that was Ivor Gurney's Ludlow and Team, which is featured on this album. And right. actually the reason that I came to this piece for the album was I loved it so much back in 2012 that I just knew I had to put out my own version of it because there's very few actual recordings with the string quartet. I think there's maybe three others. Mm. Um, so when I proposed the Ivor Gurney Ludlow and team, had you ever heard of Ivor Gurney before? I had a little bit. Um, there's not, there wasn't much exposure. Uh, I, that period of British composers was not well, um, fleshed out in my mind. I knew some quilter songs from before and I knew some Britain songs from after some Finzi, but, um, that sort of early 20th century time I was not familiar with. However, I did know the pretty famous song uh, of Gurney's called Sleep. It's pr it probably the most famous song, at least um, among uh, students at American colleges, universities, and conservatories, you know. Uh, I played course. it a few times and a few other pieces of his, but none of them that were a big set like Ludlow and Team. And you can really see the, the narrative that follows through that whole group of songs. So. Yeah, I actually think the first time I heard of Ivor Gurney was when I was in my undergrad at Eastman, and I heard it through a song rep class. I heard Sleep, 
Yeah. Um, and so many of the people who have heard that I'm doing this album have asked, oh, Ivor Gurney, are you, is Sleep on the CD? And I say, well, it didn't really fit the program theme when we were trying to put everything together. So we've actually gone ahead and Steve and I met up a few weeks ago safely and uh, were able to perform Sleep. It was actually one of the first things I've sang in about four months, which is just insane to think about. But uh, so we're going to give you a little segment here of Ivor Gurney's most famous art song, at least in the US, Gurney's Sleep. And we're back now with Steve. And I wanted to talk a little bit about song selection and how we came up with the program. And I must admit here that the majority of the mastermind behind the entire program is Steve himself. He absolutely is a genius at finding lesser known repertoire and putting them together in a beautiful way as he has done on this album. And I wanted to just discuss that a little bit with him. Sure. Um, so with, with the starting work of the Gurney um, and then knowing something about the poet, which is always the best place to see if you can find some linkage, um, A.E. Hausman, I was looking at other composers. There's Butterworth. There's some works by John Ireland that are by uh, Hausman that are from a Shropshire lad, which is where the Gurney text comes from. Um, and it wound me taking to these other Ireland pieces, which was pretty cool. Um, but also in the similar vein, anything in the 20th century that's British makes me think of Benjamin Britten and something that might work with the Gurney. I was just thinking, what could go with this? And I'm like, well, the Gurney songs are focused a lot about youth. Um, they're not specifically about uh, a war or a, a certain war in British history, but um, they talk a lot about youth 
expiring or a nostalgia for one's youth or one's homeland. And I was thinking about Britain songs. Um, and then I was looking through my stuff and I found this collection that was supposed to go alongside kind of like a volume two of Britain's um, one of his first major and most popular song cycles called On This Island. It was supposed to be like On This Island Volume 2. Same poet, W.H. Auden, um, but they were never published in Britain's lifetime and they were only published in the 90s, 1990s uh, by Boozy and Hawks. It's called Fish in the Unruffled Lakes and it's titled for one of the songs. It's not like the whole cycle is about fish or something or lakes even. Um, and they seemed a lot more... Um, personal and they took some chances they were kind of bold um there were some themes in there that i was not uh expecting to find um and one of them was the was sort of a pretty outright um and bold statement about you know be who you are love who you love and just go for it um, and that was actually interesting because we found out that a lot of those composers and poets are actually gay at that right. time. And right. they don't actually share the same freedoms and rights that we do 100 years later. Right. So um, I think that kind of started to lead us down a path, which led us to, uh, you were mentioning John Ireland. Right. And the, the Hausman songs, his most famous group of them, um, which the name of it is escaping me at the moment, uh, but that's where the song a lad, a Lad's Love comes from. I think it's called... Oh, yes. The uh, Land of Lost Content. That's it. That's the one. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, the cycle we chose, because I, I thought you know, we had a lot of Shropshire Lad songs, and it didn't need to, we didn't need to rehash that. It didn't need to be a whole album about Shropshire Lad. Um, and so I thought, why don't we try these other songs? Plus, it's just a small three-song grouping. Um, so we chose Wheel to the Woods No More. And then we also pulled Lad's Love out of that other set. Um, this island set was pretty cool and it was also unusual, I mean, rare even, because one of the songs is just for piano solo, but it has a title. It's not just called Interlude or you know Prelude or something. Um, it even has lyrics, doesn't it? It has a few lines of poetry from one of the Shropshire Lad poems, which is really interesting. So clearly they were kind of meant to go or be a sort of later in life reflection on Shropshire Lad, later in Hausman's life. Um, and in fact, those poems were not published in Hausman's life either, the poems that were selected, that Ireland used to set uh, a set for the Wheel to the Woods No More. Does that make sense? I hope so. <laughs> of course. And I actually remember when you sent me the uh, Britain Fish in the Unruffled Lakes, um, we had been talking about a program and trying to figure out what would go with the Ivor Gurney. And you right. sent me this while I was on a treadmill down in the gym. And <laughs> I came up immediately and I ran into my bedroom and I had to sing through it. And I have a little clip of that and I wanted to share that with you right now. Awesome. Um, well, one of the other uh, composers of that time that I think is really well known is Roger Quilter. Yep. Yeah, we chose a single song of Quilter's, one of his more famous ones, Love's Philosophy. It's a song that I love. I love to play. Honestly, it's a lot of fun to play the piano. And it's also just a beautiful song. Um, and it fits into the theme, uh, not because of the poetry or the poet necessarily, but because of the composer's um, homosexuality. And it's an interesting way uh, to reinterpret that song, to think of him wanting to be the person who is coupled up with another matching partner, um, as it says in the poem, which is cool. Uh, and then we also chose a song by Peter Warlock, who's also maybe not as well known, but but still a, a really interesting figure in early 20th century British song. Um, and this song, I'm going to be honest, I chose it simply because I saw the words Ann Arbor in it, which is where Brian and I met at school. And I was like, what a fun song. And it actually happens to work really well in terms of thematically with the album. It provides something that's a little more... Uh, lighthearted and introductory. I think we started most of our recital programs with it, didn't we? It's exactly how we started. Right. 
And now I have actually recordings of uh, Roger Quilter's Love's Philosophy. And I wanted to share a clip of two different recitals for you here. And so enjoy Roger Quilter's Love's Philosophy. as we continue our conversation about the songs on the album and why we chose them and how they ended up being on the album, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming English composer Ian Venables. I have to say I was absolutely drawn to his music. He's one of the best known English song composers of his generation. And I'm so happy to welcome Ian Venables. How are you? I'm fine, thank you, Brian. Thank you for inviting me to talk from across the pond. Oh, it's such a pleasure to see you. <laughs> well, I wanted to tell everyone kind of how I came to know your music and how I ended up getting connected to you. Um, as many people may or may not know, I am represented by Helen Sykes Artist Management over in London. And so when I was talking to her about two years ago about my album, uh, she mentioned, oh, you should get in involved with the Ivor Gurney Society, and I have this, this email for you, so here, email this person and talk to them a little bit about it. Um, this person happened to be you, <laughs> and that's kind of how I got to know you, and then you said, well, hey, since you're doing all of these Hausman pieces, uh, or Gurney pieces with Hausman text, you should consider looking at some of my works. And you threw me some information about um, the song that we eventually actually put on the album. Uh, and what people don't know is that this piece, Because I Liked You Better, is actually, I believe it's the fourth movement in a cycle. Um, and unfortunately, we only learned about the cycle about um, a month before we went into the recording sessions. So we didn't have time to throw the whole entire cycle together. And I wanted to ask you a little bit to, to tell us a little bit more about this cycle. Right, well, um, the cycle is called Songs of Eternity and Sorrow. And I was commissioned to write this cycle back in 2004 uh, for the Hausman Society, I suppose linked with the Finzi Friends Society as well. So it was a kind of joint commission. Um, I'd always wanted to set Hausman, but for some reason hadn't really um, explored his poetry, um, mainly because so many composers have, have written, have set Hausman. I mean, there are over 500 known settings of Hausman. It's quite incredible. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at specifically the Shropshire Lad collection, practically all of those have been set. And then other ones, like, for example, The Loveliest of Trees, the poem, and I Was One and Twenty, there are 40 settings of just those two poems. And so I was perhaps inhibited by the fact that so many great composers had set Hausen, and I, I wasn't sure whether I'd be able to do it or not. So but, what specifically drew you to these specific Hausman poems? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, what I did then what was when, when I was commissioned, I thought, well, let's have a look through all the volumes. Unfortunately, there was a list by someone called Bill Lewis, who compiled a list of all the known settings. 
and I could tick off where they all came from. So obviously the majority from the Shropshire Lad collection, but there were actually quite a few missing poems in terms of settings from the late volumes, additional poems and more poems. And so I thought, well, I'll start there. So let's have a look at those. So I, I looked at all the ones that hadn't been set. And there were many, of course, that were unsettable. Some of them were very jingoistic and I could see why composers had ignored them. But there were then others, I thought, yes, this, these are wonderful poems, but why? Why haven't they set them? And then, of course, you realize the themes are just not kind of the kind of themes that, that you would have set in the 20th century. For example, Easter Hymn, which opens my cycle, is all about questioning Christianity and the whole basis of the resurrection. Well, you can't imagine many composers wanting to set that particular <laughs> poem. And then, of course, there are many poems about his unrequited love for Moses Jackson. And Because I Like You Better, the one that you have recorded, is, of course, all about that subject. Hausman's love of Moses J Jackson runs through all his poetry. Most of his poetry is infused with this issue. Um, and what brought this home to me is this amazing letter which he writes in 1922, knowing that, how, uh, that Moses Jackson is dying. Uh, Moses is, is, in Jack, uh, sorry, is in Canada, and he is desperate to get his latest volume of poetry called Last Poems off to Moses. And so, uh, and of course he wrote this l amazing letter, which I'd just like to read part of um, Please. to you. Um, it was written on the 19th of October, 1922. Now, Hausman begins the letter by telling Moses how successful he's been as a poet. But then he goes on to say, please realize that I am an eminent bloke, though I would much rather have followed you round the world and blacked your boots. The eminent poet would willingly have exchanged his fame and position for a chance of following his correspondence in the humblest capacity to the furthest corners of the earth. Wow. Very moving letter. Especially yeah. after all those years and after all he'd... Yes. Wow. He kept a photograph of Moses on his desk to, his, to the end of his days. And they didn't meet or, or really... Um... Well, I mean, once Moses left for Canada, that, that was it. Yeah. Sadly. Wow. So it's a very, yeah, very sad story. And indeed, the other one I said, Oh, Who's That Young Sinner? is about the Oscar Wilde trial. So these were themes that composers probably wanted to avoid, but which I, and those are exactly the themes I wanted to set. Well, and I think that's exactly why we fell in love with the piece, is it just fit the theme that we were finding together so well. And uh, Steve and I mentioned this earlier, and in an earlier segment that, you know, a hundred years ago, gay men did not have the rights and the freedoms that we do now. And so, yeah. Brian, why are you putting a 21st century piece on your album when the rest of it is 20th century? That's exactly why I'm putting it on, because it's a different voice of the same time, and it's a way to bring the album to a close into the 21st century. Absolutely. It's a, I mean, I feel very honored to be included, of course, but in a sense, my tradition is that tradition. So I, my own music springs from that tradition. Well, I wanted to take an opportunity and just play for people a little bit of the song since they don't get to see any videos tonight of that piece, but I wanted them to hear a little bit of it. So here's a little bit of Because I Liked You Better.
Oh, thank you so much, Ian. It's such a pleasure to sing this music. Is there um, anything you wanted to tell us about the Ivor Gurney Society or what drew you to his music in particular and uh, what your role is with the Ivor Gurney Society? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I discovered Ivor Gurney in 1995 by reading a book called Stars in a Dark Night, which is by the author Anthony Bowden. And it's really um, all about Gurney's tragic life story. And so I wanted to know more about Gurney and I knew that he had written songs, but I didn't know them. And so Anthony Bowden introduced me to his songs and his poetry. And before long, I had joined the society. And then uh, in 2004, when Anthony Bowden, who was the chairman of the society, stepped down, I, I stepped into his shoes and, and carried on being chairman of the society. And I've been chairman ever since for over 15 years now. Uh, I'm also the lead trustee of the Ivor Gurney estate, which looks after uh, the archive of Ivor Gurney's music and poetry in Gloucester. Uh, and we're there to try and uh, promote and preserve his great legacy. So that's really how, how it all started. Yeah, but I think more most importantly, he is, um, for me, one of the first truly great art song composers. I mean, Vaughan Williams, for me as an English composer, is the first English art song composer. But of course, uh, Gurney was taught by Vaughan Williams. And so he just follows very naturally. And the reason why I say this is because of Gurney's incredible engagement with poetry at a very fundamentally deep level. He's very instinctive with his engagement of the emotional narrative of each poem. And, and you know that the, that the words are center stage and all the music's inspired from the words. Mm. And that's the hallmark of art song. And that's why he's so important I, for me. It's so true. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times people have heard the gurney and just said, I've never heard musical language like that. I mean, no um, when, I, when I meet with the strings later this evening, I'm, yeah. I'm sure they're gonna talk about the first times that we actually got to read through the piece and how difficult it was mm -hmm. to really capture the language that he was going for. Cause it's not always exactly tonal and it just takes you through this weird path sometimes, but it's all so incredibly musical mm -hmm. and so captures the exact moment of the text. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, if I can put you on the spot for a moment, uh, since you're such an Ivor Gurney uh, uh, scholar, is there anything that people won't find about him in either our liner notes or a biography about him? Is there anything that you can share with us that might be an interesting tidbit of information? Well, I mean, there's so much I could tell you. <laughs> it's a short time, really. Um, <laughs> But uh, as you've uh, sung, um, you put on Ludlow and Teen, magnificent, wonderful cycle of his. Um, you may not know, but when it was first performed, it was performed in Marion Scott's house in 1920. Now, Marion Scott was the, um, the secretary of the Royal College of Music and a great supporter of Gurney and wanted to you know, um, promote him. So uh, she organized this very, very important premiere along with Vaughan Williams' was On When Lock Edge, was in the same concert. And she invited all the great names of London to this particular event. And of course, it was performed wonderfully well, and the audience were clapping away, and they were going, where's the composer? And they, they couldn't find him. And they went looking for him. And eventually they found him behind a bookcase, cowering in the corner. <laughs> they dragged him out. You know, he's so obviously amazed by the response to wow. his but that's, that's just a, a funny little uh, aside. But that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember that it was, I think it was March of 1920 that that first premiere was. And that's, yes. that's why it was so important for us to get this disc out in the early part of 2020 is we wanted to be yes. able to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the piece. Yes. And then of course he wins the Carnegie Trust Prize mm. for that work, which really launches him, I think, as a composer. I'm curious, did you find anything, um, or you chose to, to make your cycle have the same instrumentation as Ludlow and Team and as On Wenlock Edge by Vaughn Williams. Um, what do you find that's sort of special or um, uh, wonderful about that or instrumentation? Or Well, I think that, yes, the On Wenlock Edge, I think when you know that so well, it's such a powerful, wonderful cycle and the gurney, of course. Hmm. And I, I, 
as I developed my own songwriting and started to think about adding instruments to the basic duo of piano and voice, I wanted to go beyond that. Mm -hmm. And when uh, I, I started to think, well, there aren't that many cycles for this particular combination. And I wondered why not, because it's such a wonderful, wonderful um, texture, isn't it, and sound world. And I thought, well, why haven't composers really done this? So I thought, well, I'm going to have a go. Uh, I started with a string quartet cycle and built up to this you know, quintet arrangement. Um, but I think I suppose it was those early cycles by Gurney and Vaughan Williams that made me think about doing it, um, writing one myself, yeah. Mm. Well, I just want to thank Ian so much for joining us virtually from across the pond. I've been such a fan of your music and I can't wait to dig into more. It's been a great pleasure, Brian. Thank you so much for inviting me. So now we're going to hear a little bit of the John Ireland song that we took out of his cycle, The Land of Lost Content, um, Lad's Love. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you the string quartet that played on the Ivor Gurney and the Ian Venables on the disc, made up of violinists Katie Hewn and Ben Russell and violist Jessica Meyer and cellist Michael Katz. Thank you guys so much for joining us this evening. It's great Thanks to be here. Having... So I wanted to talk to Katie for a moment uh, because she was the first person I spoke to about this project. Um, I had heard her play at Trinity Wall Street, where we have both worked for several years, and just fell in love with her solo playing, and knew that if I was looking for a string quartet, it was exactly who I wanted to be leading up some sort of a group. Um, and, you know, many people when I was talking to them said, oh, you should have an established quartet, it would make things easier, they play together all the time. And I said, you know what, I really trust Katie to curate a group of players and it's New York, people are playing together all the time anyway, so they're kind of used to it. Um, Katie, can you talk a little bit about why you chose the specific players that people are seeing on the screen and um, the difference between a quote unquote pickup group and quote unquote established quartet? <laughs> Well, first of all, I'm so, so honored and flattered that Brian asked me to be a part of this project. I know how much love and passion and care he put into every single detail here. So um, I just feel my heart is very full to be a part of it. Thank you, Brian. I want to start Thank there. Thank you. Um, second, 
it's a little bit weird to be called a pickup string quartet when I know these players and I've played with them and I feel so comfortable with them. You know, I've known them for a while. I used to be part of a serious string quartet, the Amphion Quartet, for about seven years. So um, with that experience under my belt, this kind of felt, you know, uh, like a comfortable thing for me to, to pursue. Um, I really wanted people who were adventurous. I wanted people who were open-minded and I wanted people that would give 150%. And so this was kind of a no brainer for me, really. I mean, I, I played with Ben and Jessica and Michael in Trinity a lot. We've had a lot of adventures together and um, I knew that this was kind of a ride or die team. So I'm also really grateful that they said yes when I asked them and that Brian trusted me as well. Well, I think that's the really interesting thing is when we got into the room, there was no single person that was leading the situation. Everyone had a voice and was able to really dive into the music and figure out how it worked together as a team rather than, you know, having some sort of hierarchy on how it worked. Um, and giving 150% is exactly what everyone did. I mean, even if there was the slightest issue in a recording session, one of us wasn't happy enough with it and we would go back and do it until we had it. Um, yeah. And, you know, speaking of the first time we met together, actually that happened the week of the recording um, when we started rehearsals for the Gurney and the Venables. Um, and I remember distinctly the first time we played through one of the movements of the Gurney and uh, Jessica is also a very well-established um, composer and her experience with the Gurney the first time I think was the most exciting for me because I was familiar with the language of the composer but I don't think he's really well known as a, I don't think he's written many things for strings. Um, and so what was your experience Jessica with with the language that Gurney is writing? Well, coming uh, from this sort of string quartet tradition of how especially Beethoven and Brahms like would write that sort of very lush string writing, here we are in uh, this part of the century, listening to a composer who really had this sort of uh, little ADD, if you will, like we do this for a little while and then go over here. And there was a lot of like, you know, things that you would just be morphing and very episodic. And as string players who usually play of that time period, it's not something we see all the time. So we would just sit there very bemused, like, wow, he had this thought and then it just trailed off into this instrument or like at that one movement where it ends with a big second violin solo. And we're like, what is this? this but, it, it, but it was great because I think everybody in the group has equal amounts of experience playing new music. And so it didn't catch us off guard. We're like, oh, wow, here's somebody who's sort of in between these two lands and they're harmonic language exists in this way. And so it was nice to build that bridge between that sort of romanticism that's so clearly in this music to the, you know, the kinds of episodicness of the, you know, new, new, new music pieces have. So it was, it yeah. was it, 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 allowed, it, it sort of, it got us talking for sure. And Katie, you had mentioned something about uh, the key that the second movement in this piece is in. Uh, the second movement of the Gurney, which happens to be probably one of my favorite pieces on the album, just because it's this slow, taffy-like uh, piece that just extends for four minutes long of what feels like one long phrase and doesn't give up until the very end. Um, it's in D-flat major. And... Katie, can you talk a little bit about how that works for a string player? Right. I mean, when I first saw that, I thought, what was he thinking? <laughs> it's a really uncomfortable key. It is very, very uncomfortable. I mean, typically we're used to composers writing in keys that are not based on accidentals, A, D, E, G, C, because those notes resonate with our open strings. So there's an extra resonance naturally from the instrument. But when you when you give us a key that's all accidental, it kind of dampens that possibility. Not to mention, it hits a lot of the wolf tones on my violin, um, which is kind of dorky talk, but you know, it, it doesn't shed my violin in the best light. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the, it's like a camera angle, basically. It's like, oh, this doesn't bring out the best of my violin. But I realized that he was really, you know, as I got to know that piece, there's so much 
there's such a vulnerable element to it that I, I loved. And also, you know, he asked for it to be muted. And I realized that he was really going for a certain color, a certain vibe that um, I just, you know, we could swim in for days, really. I mean, I, I remember specifically the time that we spent on that piece and how much it did for us when we came out of it. I mean, it really was a journey in itself. Well, and speaking of intr instruments and how they work, um, I remember something that caught me off guard and kind of scared me the week of the, the recording. And I don't think I necessarily said it out loud, but it was certainly in the back of my mind. Um, Michael was actually shopping for new instruments that week um, and looking for a new cello. And I remember thinking to myself, wow, if I had a different voice, I'm not sure I could <laughs> play around with it. But it's not the same with, with strings, is it, Michael? Um, yes and no, actually. Um, well, I've act, um, maybe uh, I've spoken with some of you about this before, but I've been shopping for a cello for about three and a half years. And, and I've probably performed over that time on 20 plus instruments. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, it'll be after a week or two weeks of trying and sometimes I'll have a concert after a day of trying an instrument. And of course it takes time to get used to it, but um, um, ultimately, uh, for string players or, or any instru any instrument, but I think especially for string players, um, we we kind of develop our own voice, our own style of playing, and and each instrument is different. But essentially, you're looking for an instrument that can bring out the best of a few. Um, the instrument itself is not what's going to create your special sound, but but it can it can highlight it. It can really it can really bring the best in uh, in who you are, and. And you might remember, I actually, during our first rehearsal, I was playing on a different cello and I returned it the day or the next day after our first rehearsal. And then I showed to the second rehearsal with a, with a different instrument that I just picked up that day. And, uh, and I ended up buying that instrument after three and a half years of looking. And one, one of the things that actually was very fortuitous for me is that we ended up doing this recording. Um, when one thing that I found when I was trying instruments, um, you get a very different experience when you're playing um, alone and when you're playing in a group, uh, because you wanna see how the instrument relates to other instruments and, and other voices in, in, in your case as well. And it's going to resonate differently. It's going to blend differently. And, and I have had the experience in the past where, uh, because I play so much chair music, um, practicing at home in an instrument and thinking, oh, you know, that really sounds great. And then, uh, the first rehearsal I had with other people, I'm like, this is not going to work. <laughs> it just doesn't work with other instruments. And and as as Jessica mentioned with uh, with the gurney, it's it's really not traditional string writing, but there's something about it that really works, and it it really it really feels like the resonance of the strings and the piano and the voice somehow almost miraculously it works together perfectly. So. Um, it, it was a really wonderful way to explore this instrument and really see um, what it can do. And, um, you know, we recorded obviously in a very, very nice space and, um, and, and, you know, seeing how it re reacts to everybody's instruments and to your voice and to the piano. Uh, it was a very educational uh, experience and it really um, it made my decision very easy in the end. <laughs> so what you're saying is that the cello solos on this disc are the first time that that cello that you now own is premiered from you. Um, yeah. That's amazing. And um, Steve, you actually had an instrument that you had never worked with uh, before, which is typical for a pianist. Um, but we were fortunate enough to have a brand new Steinway D concert grand from Hamburg uh, donated to the project by another recording group that was going to be in the same space as us the following week. We actually had five concert grands on that stage during the recording. Right. And so you got to choose one and that ended up being, I think the, the newest one out there. Was there anything right. you wanted to say about that piano while we're talking about instruments? If I could buy it, I would. Um. <laughs> <laughs> if if I could if I could sell something of my body parts to to own that piano, I would. No, it was really wow. a real special. Thing. <laughs> um, Fantastic. I don't even I don't even think it was for sale, but it was it was really wonderful, and and it made every minute in that hall with all of you guys um, something I didn't have to worry about. I could just basically think and play, and it would do it, which is so cool. And not always the case with pianos you get to use. So. 
And Ben, I remember um, learning about you for the first time and getting to experience your involvement in music is so varied and you've had such a, um, I don't want to say non-traditional path, but I want to say like you, you dabble in everything in terms of string playing. Um, and I remember distinctly hearing your singing and playing, you know, in, in a folk style. And I feel like you actually brought some of that to this recording in figuring out how to experience the gurney. Is there anything that you found particular about the gurney that you were able to take that experience and blend it into? Well, I, to go along with what uh, uh, Jessica was saying there about the episodic kind of nature, um, there was a lot of this uh, folky, um, you know, English folk that came through. Uh, when I was when I was in college, I joined an, an English folk band, which I didn't even know what it was when I joined. <laughs> but I learned a lot about English folk music and uh, uh, kind of its relation then to Appalachian folk as it came over here. And uh, um, a lot of that kind of roots music uh, uh, that I now enjoy uh, started over there. And to hear kind of how uh, Gurney like weaves a lot of these simple but, but very elegant tunes uh, in a folky way uh, definitely inspired me to also play it slightly different. Maybe use maybe less vibrato on this line or, you know, cause it had romanticism with it, but there are also times when just the simplicity of the line was what it called for. And so I think that was fun for me to try and figure out how to bring across some of those kind of natural folk elements uh, in playing this piece, and, uh, uh, you, but in a kind of romantic string quartet setting, so. Well, and we've all heard this evening some excerpts of the music with this fabulous string quartet. Um, and I'm sad that we weren't able to actually meet up in person and do a proper release party. Uh, but I'm glad that we actually had the time to discuss all of this this evening in this format um, to bring more light to how the album was curated and how everything worked together. And that's not something you would typically get in a traditional release party. So I want to thank Ben, Katie, Jessica, and Michael for joining us this evening. What I've done next for you is I've taken videos from 2012 from the first time Steve and I performed this uh, Ivor Gurney piece in my master's degree recital and I've put it together as a montage going through the time um, of us performing it in recitals all the way to the recording with this spectacular group and I wanted to share that with you now and I'm embarrassingly calling it the journey of Gurney. <laughs>
And now I'm happy to introduce one of my dear friends, Reggie Mobley. He's an international countertenor that has been heard on stages and recordings alike, typically of the Baroque period. And I'm so thrilled that he was able to join us for this project for the Britain. So thank you so much, Reggie, for joining us this evening. Hey. Um, so speaking of Baroque music, I wanted to ask you, what is it like being asked to come in and sing a Britain piece written in 1950s when the typical things that audiences would hear you on either a recording or on stage would be Baroque music of the 17th century or such? I think it's just a, it's just a different challenge. It's just something new to try or just something outside of what I typically do. It's, it's. I mean, as a countertenor, Britain is kind of in the in in our package of of this is what a countertenor should sing and should know, and honestly, it's just kind of a muscle group that I haven't worked on at all. Uh, this is this is a leg day that I've ignored for forty two years, and <laughs> I'm finally getting around to it. You know, I've heard I've approached the piece many times, or I've been asked to to sing it many times. It never pan pan panned out, and you know, I've always heard it and I've like, it's a great piece. And at some point I'd love to give it a shot, but I didn't think it was for me since I kind of like to stay within my, you know, within my range of, of really just doing as much Bach as possible. <laughs> but once I, I, you know, once you asked me, Brian, to, to sing and record this with you and I, you know, bought the score and really started digging into it, I realized that more than, than difference in style, this there really is no difference in actual affect or our dramatic intent and weight. Like this it absolutely is a piece that Reggie could and should sing. And so because one, I don't I I am I'm a person of faith. You know, I, I, I have you know, I have belief in, and and I think knowing this story for so long it, it was interesting to approach it from this, you know, from this view, a musical view and from and from Britain's mind and his pen and dig into it from that angle. And it just created an interesting challenge to see if I could kind of express my belief in these things, but also kind of retroactively infuse the human element into these stories that we've read growing up in Bible school. Like these weren't, even though we think of them as as parables and fables and whether you believe or not you know that may or may not be true but the point of the fact is that this is it's either was or these are based on events that that took place for real human beings and we need to learn not just in you know in our in our beliefs and our faith but also just in just approaching composers and roles and everything we have to learn how to kind of infuse what we do with the human element because it is about us. Uh, and so it was just a new challenge to take a style that I'm not too, a language that I don't speak too well, but understanding how people feel and, and putting myself into this role in that way and, and, and kind of letting me be Isaac, but also letting Isaac be me. Like it's all those things together really created um, a great chance for me to just kind of dig into this whole thing like it just i don't know it's it's i don't really think of it as going from baroque music to to you know 20th century music but as to just this is just a new angle of humanity and music and and feeling and, and emotion that i just haven't explored yet so it was just it was an it was an eventuality and i'm just glad i got to do it with y'all it was an absolute pleasure yeah the interesting thing that the audience doesn't necessarily know about this is that we didn't have a chance to perform this work together um, as a group before we went to the recording studio, um, which is almost a little, at least for me, almost a little bit surprising, shocking, embarrassing, just uh, thinking of my own emotions, because I'm like, oh, how is this going to go? How, how will we get this done in the allotted time? Um, but it's a testament to how, how phenomenal a musician both of you are um Likewise. uh to make this just happen so quickly and in and with such i think um profundity you know? well i think 
we're fortunate, um, or at least I'm certainly fortunate to have worked with Reggie several times in the past five or six years since I've known you. And um, those times have given me, and some of those times were even in a choral setting rather than some so, sort of soloistic setting. So we both had the knowledge of how to work in that way. And to blend our voices together to create the voice of God, I think is what just came easy for us. Mm. And then straying from that to kind of make it into our own solo moments when we're Abraham and when we're Isaac and talking about um, things that way. So I think that lent to us being able to put it together so quickly. Mm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's an issue of, of established friendship and, and teamwork. Like, mm. I'm wearing a Wonder Woman t-shirt and there's a TARDIS console behind me. I'm a big nerd. And so a lot of my analogy metaphors are nerdy as well. And I think of it in a way that, you know, think of Batman and Robin, how they train together for so long. And then Robin goes away, becomes Nightwing. But whenever they come back together, they know exactly how the other is going to act. They know how he's going to behave. They know how to compensate for each other's issues. Like I came into this project you know, we didn't have a lot of time and we didn't perform this beforehand, but coming into it, I knew how Brian would sing certain phrases. I knew how he would prepare himself, how his breathing worked. I knew exactly how, you know, when, you know, when certain consonants and vowels would activate, like all those things, you know, we, I understood because we worked together for so long and I know Brian's intelligence as well and how he works as a musician. And so it's just, just walking right into it, knowing exactly how he's going to do it. And it makes it easy for me because I then know how I can do it. Um, even having not sung a note of this piece together, you know, until we started, it was as though we'd been singing it, you know, <laughs> rehearsing it for quite some time already, just because we have this rapport. And that's, you know, that's something that's great about, you know, having known Brian and working with people like him for so long. Well, and I wanted to give our audience a little bit of a chance to listen to a p part of the piece tonight. Um, I don't have any video clips, but here's a short, brief audio clip from Britain's Canticle to Abraham and Isaac. One of the things I wanted to ask or just mention and see if you guys have any feedback is I have a theory that um, based on what you, Reggie, specifically were talking about um, and your experience with Brian together singing choral works, both as, both as soloists and as members of the ensemble. Um, I think that's part of why this this performance on the CD works so well is because at the very beginning and then in the middle at some point and then sort of at the end, kind of, you're almost a two-person choir singing as the voice of God, singing in unis like unison, hom homophony at least, you know, singing the same number of notes at the same time. And it's it's stunning and it's also beautifully written, but I think that's a special treat. And of course, that's the very first thing we hear of the two of you. And then we hear this musical separation of your instruments as you become the characters. Um, anyway, you have any thoughts about that? I think it's uh, it, it actually does show off a bunch of choral training. I think you hear, you can almost always tell the difference between um, soloists or opera singers, concert singers, or recitalists who have a history in, cor in intense choral training because you see that they have this versatility, that they're able to fit in different styles and in different voices as best they can. There's a, there's a, there's an 
instinct and intuition, a way of listening where you're able to adjust and fit inside all these specific boxes of sounds and affects. And I mean, in groups, you know, that we've, that we've worked with, we've definitely had to, you know, kind of pull all these tools together and create an arsenal, a little toolbox where we can go from, from, you know, from thin to full to senza grotto to sotto voce and, you know, within the span of a few phrases mm -hmm. and also doing so while actively listening to the person next to you, the person across from you, uh, or, or another, you know, another voice part or on your own voice part and somehow stay in lockstep and do so with, you know, creating this, this unison, this uniform sound. Um, and that all comes from choral singing. Like you become a better soloist because of the training and work you've done uh, in choirs. And Steve, when we were talking about the program to put this all together, uh, what was the reasoning behind putting this with our, our theme? We talked a lot about innocence and, and ways or depictions of innocence being lost. And this might very well be one of the top three examples of that kind of thing from, you know, the sort of Western tradition, the Christian tradition. Um, it's also a remarkably dramatic piece that's more on an art song scale, given that's with piano and just two voices. Uh, I, I thought it would suit you very well, of course. Um, and then you knew Reggie and it suits you both so beautifully. So um, more Britain is always great, but specifically the people who can do it well. Well, I want to thank Reggie so much for taking the time this evening to join us. Uh, thank you so much and have a great evening, buddy. Thank you. And now I want to move on to the next portion of the evening, which is bloopers. Throughout this whole process between recitals, recordings, and these intimate Zoom or uh, personal recording sessions, there have been a lot of bloopers to choose from. So here's a couple of minutes of some of our favorite moments from the whole journey. <laughs> Ready? Yep. The music on this album features The music on this album features no like being a daddy <laughs> <laughs> a daddy who is willing to kill um... <laughs> Real. 
Well, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Steve for joining us this evening. Uh, he's been an incredible friend, colleague, and the most amazing pianist. He was the most secure person in that entire recording session. He, like, next to no mistakes the entire three days. It was easy to edit him. I was the issue. So I just want to thank Steve for his time and being here with us this evening. Well, thank you for having me and for involving me, Brian. I'll give you that 20 bucks for saying that later. Okay. I will say I wouldn't mind driving to Manhattan and having a drink with you, though. That part I would be happy to Fine. do. So. Fine. Right. I'm getting in the car right now. I'll see you. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in and watch. I hope you have enjoyed getting to know more about the album and hope that you will consider purchasing the album available tomorrow, July 3rd, on all major platforms. With your hard copy purchase, you will receive extensive liner notes by our own Stephen McGee, telling you more about the composers and the poets and the history of these songs and why we paired them together. As our industry has been temporarily shuttered due to the global pandemic, I ask that you consider making a tax-deductible donation towards Giebler Musical Arts at the link below and help supporting our next project. I hope you are safe, healthy, and staying sane during these uncertain times. Have a great evening. The lad that loved you. Thank you.